Hello, my name is Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and this is Talk Gnosis. Today we have a super awesome show with a super awesome recurring guest, Nick Lachetti. Hello, Nick. Hey, good to have you. Good to be on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's awesome to have you back. And we're talking about uh, a topic that that the people are going to hear more about in the future on Talk Gnosis, so we can't reveal anything yet. But it's it's uh, as a Canadian, I'm happy to announce uh, one of Canada's. Uh, most famous and influential esotericists, Gnostics, magicians, uh, mystic, Catholic, Thelemites, um, Frater uh, a, a topic that uh, that I've been hearing about since I got into the esoteric. Uh, his reputation precedes him. Uh, his work is is often, even by some who dislike him, not all, thought to be very interesting and groundbreaking, but who I haven't really engaged with. So I'm really excited to talk to you uh, about uh, Charles Stanfield Jones, uh, Frater Akkad. Um, Nick, uh, yeah. can you give us the elevator answer? Who was Charles Stanfield Jones? Um, sure. Uh, so, yeah, so Charles Stanfield Jones, so better known as Frater Akkad, which was not his real name, um, but is generally the name people know him by. Um, he was an occultist, the Lemite, and esoteric writer. He lived from 1886 to 1950 mostly in the United States and Canada. Uh, so he's mostly associated with Vancouver, um, I believe. And then, um, so he's, he's best known for his association with Aleister Crowley. Um, so people probably know who Aleister Crowley is already. And also for his break with Crowley. Um, and this ultimately led to Akkad proclaiming the Aeon of Ma'at in the late 1940s, which I think we'll talk about more later. So that's generally how people know him. They also know him, they might think they've heard that he went insane um, or that he, you know, walked nude around Vancouver, I think. Um, there's a few other stories about him, but those are the, the, the gist of it. He was Alistair Crowley's protege and magical son for a, a period of time. Yeah, and, and the, as you said, he's best known as Frater Akkad. Why is he known as Frater Akkad and not, you know, Charles Jones? Yeah, so Akkad is the Hebrew word for one, um, and Jones took that as his neophyte motto in the AA, which was Crowley's magical order. Um, so I think he was one of the earliest uh, initiates into the AA. Um, and so Akkad was was this this magical motto that he he was known by. Um, so it's also the byline under which he wrote his books. Um, so he had a number of other magical names and mottos throughout his life, but generally this is the one you'll find his books uh, written under. And then, you know, he had other ones from the AA, the OTO, and the Universal Brotherhood, um, but but most people called them Akkad. Right. Uh, we'll dive into some of this uh, later, but for those who don't know, when they hear AA, they're like, oh, okay, so he was a leader in the sobriety movement. The alcoholics uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this, this is a magical order. So, yeah, I could talk a little about, about that if people aren't familiar with it. Um, so the AA was Crowley's order that was really the successor to the Golden Dawn. So after some things went down with the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, uh, where Crowley you know, <laughs> may have had a, had a role to play and it, it kind of shattering apart. Um, Crowley's, you know, his version of it uh, was founded as the AA, though Crowley would say he didn't found it, but he was, you know, contacted by these, um, you know, the masters of the order and he, he just c continued it and wrote about it. Uh, but, but Jones, so Akkad joined as a probationer for, of the AA in 1909, which is pretty early, first few years. Um, and, you know, that was, that was basically how he got involved with Crowley. So he was, I would think he he would consider himself a lifelong member of the AA in some way. Uh, Crowley may have had a different opinion about that, but yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. And um, so, so he can you tell us more about like in what way? Like you you said that he was Crowley's magical son. A lot of people yeah. again, even if they're occultists, might be like, what what the heck does that mean? And can you talk about his relationship to Crowley and and some of the Crowley orgs or you know the the, the yeah. what what he really did or what being part of the AA meant? Yeah. So I mean, I think people know about Akkad and and you know know him as a controversial figure because of this idea that he was Crowley's magical son. Um, and you know the way that happened was uh, with a lot of things with Crowley. It was kind of a, an interesting story. It involved sex. <laughs> so um, so Crowley, you know, believed Akkad to be his magical son because Akkad uh, took the oath of the abyss in 1916, um, which is a particular s step or stage in Crowley's AA system. Mm -hmm. um, anybody can actually take the oath of the abyss. You don't actually have to be at the grade that normally one would kind of naturally take it. Um, Jones actually took it early. And this was because he believed that in order for Crowley to advance to his next grade, 
each lower grade in the hierarchy of the AA needed to be filled. Right. So Jones actually felt like he could assist Crowley with this. Um, so he advanced to this grade of eight equals three or Magister Templi, Master of the Temple, so that Crowley could advance to the next grade of, of Magus. Uh, so he did this without Crowley's knowledge. And then upon hearing this, Crowley was amazed and he noted that Jones was born as a babe of the abyss, you know, this, this, uh, this grade in the AA, nine months after uh, what he had thought was a failed sex magic operation, uh, oh, which was with a mistress named uh, Jean Robert Foster, known as Hilarion in the order. Mm -hmm. And Crowley had done this, Crowley was already getting concerned with his, you know, his legacy and who was going to succeed him. So he attempted to do the sex magical operation to, to beget a magical son. And he thought it would be like she would get pregnant <laughs> and he would have a son. Instead, he heard that, you know, at that same time, Akkad had um, taken this oath and then was born nine months later as this babe of the abyss. So Crowley was like, oh, this guy, he's my magical son. Um, that's what the, the sex magical ritual uh, must have indirectly, you know, created this, this situation. So, you know, the, it, whether or not that's true, I don't know, but <laughs> that's, that's how... Crowley first kind of got on on the idea that Jones was his magical son, and and Jones was already becoming more and more of his protege, so it kind of fit fit well with their dynamic. Yeah, and uh, everything worked out. I'm assuming. No. Um, yeah. But... Uh, Akkad <laughs> took over. It was all good. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the oath because uh, mm -hmm. uh, you can take it at any grade or anybody can take it at any time. But the idea is, if you're not ready, you'll go insane. Your head will explode. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so part of the oath is. Um, to interpret every phenomenon as a dealing with God of God with your soul. Yeah. Um, I think part of the idea of, of going insane with it is the idea that if you're not ready to do this, this could result in kind of egomania of thinking everything that happens is, you know, God speaking to you, kind of you're, you're a prophet in some way. So that definitely plays into some of the criticisms of Akkad from Crowley and other people later on. Um, it's not clear to me that that's fair, I, I think, actually, but, um, you know, that does that does play into it. The other thing is that uh, there is a prophecy in the book of the law, which, as, as folks hopefully know, is the kind of the holy text in, in Thelema, in Crowley's tradition. Um, and it says, and I'll just read that quote, which says, One cometh after him when I, when I say not, who shall discover the key of it all. It shall be his child in that strangely. So uh, Crowley also took this verse to be referring to Akkad as his son, um, who was supposed to discover the key to the book of the law, which he actually did, which we could talk about. Um, but it shall be his child in that strangely. So, you know, that's the sex magical, the sex magical operation resulted in this birth of this child. So uh, Crowley took that to be about Jones. Yeah. Well, you, you know, it, it's interesting uh, and we'll move on, but just you know, things I like to think and talk a, a lot about, about this stuff and how this stuff works. Like when you said, you know, nine months after, right? Like, was yeah. he really Crowley's magical son? But like, you know, what does that mean, right? Yeah, like, if, Crowley, <laughs> if Crowley considered himself his magical son, then he was his magical son, right? It's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm fine with with occultism and magic being built around confirmation bias in a way, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 I know that sounds um, bad, <laughs> but it's <laughs> like, again, you know, the consciousness interacting with whatever this physicality is, right? Like this is, this yeah. is magic. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> but uh, the moving on from my ramblings. Um, okay, so didn't Akkad and Crowley do some rituals that, that summoned gray aliens into New York City? Um, maybe, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> this was, so this is a reference to uh, a specific magical working called the Amalantra working. Um, and that was in, I believe, uh, in 1918. Um, so basically what happened was, was Crowley was living on West 9th Street in New York City at the time um, and did this magical working where um, him and some of his, his, you know, his members of his order contacted this, this entity who called itself the Wizard Amalantra. And it had very interesting like imagery, kind of the woods, um, eggs came up repeatedly in this. Uh, there was a, a bunch of different things. Um, the, the two really pertinent things here is that uh, Frater Akkad was present and was actually given one of his magical names, which is Frater Arkdion by Amalantra, and said, like, that, that's him. Um, that would come up a few times in Akkad's life. And then the other aspect of it is this phrase, it's all in the egg, which would recur a few times in that vision. Mm. Um, people started to relate this later on, especially Kenneth Grant, to a portrait that Crowley drew um, of a being named Lamb. And if people aren't familiar with it, Lamb 
is this this black and white portrait that Crowley drew that looks a lot like a gray alien, almost identical to the idea of a gray alien that comes later on in popular culture. Um, so some people, and Kenneth Grant has kind of furthered some of these connections, think that, you know, the, the most like low end version of this that I think was in like Vice Magazine or something is like this, this ritual opened a portal that allowed the gray aliens to come to earth. That's one of the ideas. Um, there's other more like metaphorical ways of understanding this, but yeah, that's, that's kind of where the gray alien connection came from. The one interesting thing about this that I always want to talk about is that I, my therapist prior to COVID, before everything went remote, her office was actually in the building next to this where Crowley did this ritual. When there's like a deli on the ground floor and like, and you can still see like the, the apartment on West 9th street in New York. Um, so I always wondered like how much of this, maybe the gray aliens are going into my head and that's why I'm drawn to this. I don't know, <laughs> but, but for several years I went to therapy next door to this place. So it's, you can still go over there and, and look, I wonder who owns the apartment. Yeah. Well, that, again, just, uh, you know, going back to my, my previous ramblings, these, these synchronicities, uh, fa yeah. fascinating. Um, and also uh, talking about, um, uh, sorry, what was the phrase of the egg? It's all in the egg. So Amalantra says a few times in that vision or whoever's transcribing it, it says it's all in the egg. So, you know, lamb as a gray alien has like an egg shaped head. So there's been a lot, people have made a lot of hay around, <laughs> around what that means and lamb's head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which I also will, resembles uh, a penis, but that's yes. another conversation. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> and looks like a gray alien, which mm -hmm. I think most people can picture in their heads. But uh, I will link the the portrait of Lamb in cool. in the show notes so everybody can check it out themselves or just Google it how I am. Yeah. Um, you know, that that's what does fascinate me uh, about uh, uh, Crowley, the Book of the Law, and, and now this working is, you know, for the critics of Crowley who say that, you know, he, he made everything up and he was just about control and getting laid, then yeah. these are often people who don't deeply engage with his work, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, like how he didn't know what half of the book of the law meant. Yeah. Like this idea of it being channeled and the sincerity of it. And I, I find it really fascinating mm. when you look back on their work where it's like, this happened to me. I received these, these texts, these phrases, these words, and I don't have a clue what they mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, mm -hmm. And as you said, there, there, there's a mystery in the book of the law. Um, uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, mm -hmm. That 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 really um, uh, uh, kind of drove Crowley crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just to speak to that, and maybe I'll try to make this understandable. I feel like this gets into these rabbit holes, but yes. I mentioned earlier there was a prophecy in the book of the law that said. Uh, you know, the prophet's son, magical son, or, you know, his child will discover the key to it all. And that actually happened, um, at least they believed it happened, which was that uh, Akkad, in his magical record, which is was published later as Liber 31, um, Akkad discovered the number 31 as the key to the Book of the Law, and that was in 1918 as well. And and this was, it gets a little complicated in Kabbalah, but um, in, in Gematria, uh, 31 is the value of both the word L, A-L, you know, it looks like Al, or God, that means, L means God, or La, or nothing. Um, and that interplay between L, God, and La, nothing, becomes this key to the book. Um, Crowley actually believed that that was like incredibly profound and opened up a lot of mysteries in the book of the law, including things relating to his formula of zero equals two, which has all these kind of non-dual implications and other things. And then um, there's also a line in the Book of the Law that says nothing is a secret key of this law. So it's hidden in plain sight that law or 31 was the secret key. So that actually caused Crowley to rename the Book of the Law from Liber Legis, which just means Book of the Law, to Liber L of L Legis. So when you see Liber L, it actually comes from Akkad, that, that title. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Now, um... A lot of occultists um, and uh, people who are really deep into this stuff, because I know, I know there's going to be people tuning in who know a lot more than I do about uh, uh, Palima and Crowley and Frater Akkad, but also uh, a lot of people out there who are, you know, uh, curious, new. They're going to be familiar with the famous Tree of Life. Right, mm -hmm. uh, which is very important in the Golden Dawn, then AA, then just about all Western occultism. But but I understand, didn't he put together his own version of this this <laughs> famous diagram? Um, yeah. So Akkad. So you know, a few years later, from what we've been talking about, Akkad started to write books, and the first book he wrote was called QBL or the Bride's Reception, which still you can pick up like pretty easy copies of that. 
Um, and most of the book is just a very basic kind of golden dawn AA kind of introduction to the tree of life and the spheres of the tree of life. Um, but in an appendix to that book, Akkad starts to suggest maybe we should reverse um, the paths of the tree of life. And, you know, the traditional path coming from the golden dawn through the AA, um, it starts from Keter, kind of the emanation down to Malkut following the lightning flash, um, kind of the path, the path that the tree emanates uh, down in. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the tarot trumps follow that path. You know, they're aligned with the Hebrew letters. There's a whole correspondence system where it starts with the fool and it, it goes all the way down to the end um, uh, towards the path that's between Yasad and Malkut, the, the world. Um, but Akkad suggested maybe this should be reversed and actually we're, we're climbing the tree of life. So the tarot trumps would go from uh, Malkut up to Keter. And then, you know, he developed this more in his next book, The Egyptian Revival. Um, and sometimes this is like the thing that he did that, that people declare like why he went insane or that Crowley, you know, decisively broke with him. But it really wasn't. Crowley didn't like this and he thought it was ridiculous, but it wasn't, it wasn't really the thing that caused them to break apart. It was just another thing that <laughs> caused Crowley to be pissed off about him. Uh, but yeah, some people haven't used this. And since then, like other occultists in the decades since, it's not very well known, but it has been used by some occult orders as a magical system. Yeah. Well, I, I suspect, of course, that the tree of life is dynamic yeah. and, <laughs> and yeah. that uh, many of these these systems can be applied to it. Mm -hmm. But, okay, so he says something really interesting there that we haven't touched on yet. Uh, people thought that he went crazy. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, Tell us about that, Nick. I would say that just to talk about occultism in general, this idea, if you don't know something or you have, you don't know, have the full story, you kind of fill it in with kind of a, uh, like a crazy story. So yeah. in this case, I think that Akkad is not super accessible because so many of his writings are in private hands. You know, he didn't, he wasn't very clear a lot of the time. So, you know, I think this was a rumor really. Um, and it's mostly based on the, the, the whole thing where, where Crowley and him, you know, had a falling out. Um, Crowley accused him of being a black brother, which we could talk more about. And but you know, seemed it was something that Crowley accused several people of being <laughs> if they basically had a breakup with him. Um, and I think it was also in Kenneth Grant's book, The Magical Revival, that uh, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, Akkad did a magical ritual in the nude in Vancouver that he like circled the city um, and then threw off a trench coat and was naked and he got arrested. Um, so that was some of that stuff combined. Um, tends to, to lead to this idea that he went insane, but there's no evidence of most of that actually happening. Um, so it's true, though, that right. Akkad did have these periods of like really intense initiatory experiences throughout his life. And when that happened, it did from the outside look a little bit like a nervous breakdown. So that could have also contributed, but these were usually temporary. <laughs> so he actually was very stable overall. And then, you know, by the time of his death, he had a stable family and, and he was married to his wife, Ruby, for many years. He had a home, he had foster children. He was still corresponding with students right up until his death. And having read some of those letters, he was very lucid. So it's not really, he didn't go insane, <laughs> but you know, he may have had periods of being kind of crazy, but most occultists do. So it, it doesn't seem to be worse than usual. Right. And, you know, there's an argument that um, going a little bit crazy might actually be good in occultism. <laughs> yeah, as, as long, long as you can, as you can pull can it back function. together. Yeah, and yeah. He, sometimes he would do that. So, like, when he discovered the key to the Book of the Law, some of that, that journal sounds, Libra 31 sounds really out there. But the fact he tended to be able to pull these things back together and was actually pretty consistent in his life about seeing all of this as part of, like, a magical path and experience. So, yeah. Right. So it might be some of his detractors sort of played this up. And of course, even by yeah. today's standards, if you, you know, walk around a city doing a magical ritual and then throw off your your clothes to be sky clad, to be nude, people think you're crazy, right? It doesn't but sound particularly that it sounds pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sign I don't me think up. That's crazy. Anyway. Yeah. But but many other people, even in the modern era, yeah. <laughs> will, let alone, you know, the 1910s, the 1920s, yeah. you know, what have you in Vancouver, which at that time was not, you know, Vancouver later became associated with like a West Coast hippie man, but at the time was not, not a very progressive place. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, 
you mentioned uh, the you know some of his critics and you know people who played up perhaps he was crazy and you know we talked about you mentioned uh, Crowley thinking he's a black brother but mm -hmm. you, I, I the little that I know about him is mm -hmm. it's so fascinating because some people seem to view Jones as an almost messianic figure mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and then others seem to view him as as a negative figure yeah. as as a corrupted failed magician and as you said uh. The, the, uh, a member of the Black Brotherhood. So if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, Crowley's idea of the, yeah. of the Black Brotherhood. Yeah. So, and so it's it's unclear that if all of this about, you know, Crowley's ideas of the Black Brotherhood was actually developed at the time that even that Akkad, you know, was later accused of having done this. So that's that's part of it. Like Akkad later when he was confronted with this was sort of like, you know, that didn't, that wasn't any of the conversation we were having. So part of this feels like it's a, it's a retcon, <laughs> like it's retroactively applied, but Basically, the idea there is that, you know, in crossing the abyss, um, someone in the AA system uh, has to basically, you know, empty all of yourself into the cup of Babylon. And this, you know, this is like a metaphor for kind of giving up the self and the ego um, and not kind of leaving anything behind. Um, again, that formula of zero equals two, that like by this process of equilibrium, you're going to cancel out everything. And then you kind of float over the abyss as a sheet of dust. You're no longer kind of this solid self that thinks you have this inherent self. Um, mm -hmm. So the argument is that because Akkad took the oath of the abyss and, and took it early, that he never made it out of the abyss, um, that he you know, he was still in the abyss at, later on in his life and therefore was one, insane, and then two, um, had become part of the Black Brotherhood, which Crowley believed were these kind of evil, evil failed magicians who you know, wouldn't give up all of themselves in, to Babylon and therefore um, kind of exist in the abyss forever. Um, and that until they're destroyed. So that that becomes that's kind of the villainous figures in Crowley's system. And so it's not that hard to declare if you're like had a falling out <laughs> that Akkad did that. Um, Crowley also accused other people like A.O. Spare of, of being a black brother too. So it wasn't that uncommon for him to do that. Um, there is one interesting thing about Akkad in the Abyss, which is, and I, I may have mentioned it earlier, but Akkad, at, um, you know, around the time of his falling out with Crowley, joined another magical order called the Universal Brotherhood, which is still really obscure to, to this day. Um, and the UB itself kind of has fed into some of these ideas that Akkad was a black brother, in part because the UB has this emphasis on, you know, complex philosophical writing, uh, like kind of dialectics. And there's there's a feeling there that, and, and some people in Crowley's circle said the UB um, falls under this critique about reason and Karanzin. In the Book of the Law, it says it damn. There's a there's a passage that damns the because and his kin, and so there's been some like language that the Universal Brotherhood is like part of the Black Brotherhood. So there's something there that that's kind of connected. It kind of, kind of sounds sexier than than it actually is when you read Universal Brotherhood texts, which are all very complicated and and sort of dry. But like this this kind of fell into it. And then Akkad himself, I think, say one more thing about this. Um, he actually did seem to suggests later in his life in some of his letters that he had a less negative idea about the, the non sephira dot in the tree of life than in orthodox philema um so in the ub people who were initiated were no, known as those who know and dot which is you know located in the abyss and crowley system and means knowledge there then becomes this kind of connection like those who know dwell in dot so maybe so Akkad, maybe that's him admitting he's in the black brotherhood and he lives in the abyss or something like that. So there, there's some interesting things going on there. Um, but yeah, that, that's where it comes from. Definitely, definitely. And uh, okay, so you mentioned the uh, the Universal Brotherhood, which are yeah. an obscure uh, order even by occult standards. So yeah. can you tell, tell us a little bit of like, what are their teachings and, and what do you find especially interesting and, and yeah. different in their material, especially the interesting yeah. and different part because, uh, <laughs> that, uh, hey folks, I, I got some bad news. There, there's... <laughs> <laughs> if you look at a lot of the the monographs and materials of esoteric orders, you're you're going to see a lot of the same. So yeah, tell us a little yeah. bit about them. So Universal Brothers is interesting because, at, like you say, at a, most occult orders by now are not very secret anymore. I mean, you no. could you can mostly download their teachings and rituals and stuff, but the Universal Brotherhood has actually remained really obscure and unknown to this day. And part of that is just because they were so dense and it wasn't actually that approachable. So the UB was this order. That primarily functioned through correspondence, uh, like this complex system of, of mail, basically, um, and may have been found either late 19th, early 20th century. Um, the, the main founder, there may have been others, was named Merwin Marie Snell, um, and he was this scholar of religion, Catholic scholar of religion. 
Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it was very secretive and complex and uh, it existed prior to Akkad. Some people think he made it, but that's not true. Uh, but he joined in 1921, um, which made Crowley very unhappy. Um, but the, the UB, you know, the reason it was very different than another magical order like the AA was that, well, it wasn't really magical that much. It was more of like a, an esoteric philosophy. Um, you kind of advance through it by reading these sutras, which are these texts about just many different topics, like, you know, philosophical symbolism, religious symbolism, about ritual, you know, they, they start to become very complex as you move up in the hierarchy. Um, and Akkad actually advanced to the point of being the Maha Guru, which was like one of the highest level of leaders uh, by the late 1920s. Um, and he seems to have been the only active Maha Guru left by then. So he essentially became the leader of this organization. Um, but to me, the interesting thing about it, besides the mystery, and that's, that's very unknown, um, is that even though the texts are really dry, the UB has this interesting kind of insight about how religious and philosophical ideas can all be integrated into a whole. So the other name of the UB is the Integral Fellowship or the Great Circle. So the idea is that without, not in the kind of more liberal way where everything kind of gets blurred together, but in a way where everything can remain its own kind of individual philosophy or tradition, but that mm. seem kind of metaphysically, everything has to be kind of integrated in this great circle of manifestation. So this, so actually, I think if I were to guess, and this is just me kind of guessing, but Akkad, I think already was developing his ideas about manifestation, about the interplay of God and nothing. So we saw like with El and La, with the number 31, that a lot of that comes into play in the UB in these really complex ways about the void, the plenum and the void in the UB is the essential interplay. So you have the, like the plenum, the, the, which is basically God, and then the void and, and the kind of the marriage of the two creates manifestation. And a lot of the texts are kind of working through that insight. So I think that Akkad saw something there that really connected with the insights he was getting from the Book of the Law. Right. So you know, that, that sounds uh, really interesting in some ways, really out there. Uh, definitely something I'd like to, to dive into. So yeah. so we're talking about the Universal Brotherhood. We're talking about Philema. We're talking about him, again, you know, tearing off his clothes to do this ritual. Uh, Black Brother of the Abyss. Nick, then yeah. he converted to Catholicism. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> what's up yeah. with that? So yeah, in the late 1920s, he, he was confirmed as a Catholic. And this was like a long time coming for him. Um, I think it was on Christmas Eve, 1928. Um, so, you know, what, what happened there was many members of the Universal Brotherhood were Roman Catholics, um, not even like esoteric Christians or like wandering bishops or anything. They were actually like hardcore Roman Catholics. And actually many UB members, including Akkad's previous mentor in the organization was actually a Catholic priest, um, which is by itself fascinating that there's this organization in the early 20th century that actually had Catholic priests. There were Catholic monks in it. And it had Freemasons and occultists and, and Philomites. And that's, I can't think of anything else that's like that. So already there, that is an interesting mystery, but it's unclear whether, you know, the UB allowed anybody, to, members could, could be of any religion, but I do think that there's a sense at the higher levels that you were kind of encouraged to explore Roman Catholicism because the founders had been Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in some ways you could say the UB was a kind of liberal Catholic theology which really early kind of prototype version of a liberal Catholic theology. So you could see that there. So I think that that played into it um, and kind of that being his social circle by that time. But the interesting thing with Akkad, because he related everything to his kind of spiritual journey and experience, he actually said that it was necessary for him to become a Roman Catholic because he saw it as two, two pillars of the tree. So Catholicism on one side and then kind of the, the esoteric traditions that are more influenced by Masonry on the other side. And in order to fulfill all of his initiations, he felt he had to become a Roman Catholic to see things from that side. So he did kind of relate it back and he never renounced Catholicism, but he also never fully renounced the Lima either. He kind of just started to reconcile them in these interesting ways. Um, so yeah, some people have said, and this adds to the stories about him that he joined, I think this is even written in some of the introductions to recent editions of his books, but he joined Catholicism to convert it to the law of Philema, but that is not, <laughs> that doesn't appear to be true, even though it's interesting and would, you know, Akkad trying to convert the Pope to, to Crowley's religion, but it's not, that doesn't appear to be what he was doing. No, yes. And uh, I mean, that sounds cool and, but, but a little bit ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps a yeah. little bit yeah. ambitious. Uh, Nick, you mentioned mm -hmm. the Aeon of Mash. 
Yeah. Um, and what does a cod have to do with that? Yeah. And it, I guess if you could tell us about aeons and like, you know, polemic <laughs> okay. ideas about yeah. aeons, because <laughs> Chris Crowley said we're in the aeon of Horus, right? Yeah. So like, how can we be on, in the aeon of MASH? Yeah. So, okay. At the risk of getting, <laughs> talking about aeons too much. Please. Um, so yeah, no, Crowley, no, this, this is the ramble show. <laughs> we, we know. Yeah. So Cro yeah. For, most folks know that, yeah, according to Crowley, we entered a new aeon when mm -hmm. he received the book of the law in 1904, which was the aeon of Horus. Yes. Um, previously, we were in the Aeon of Osiris, which was kind of each Aeon is kind of like typified by different magical formula and religious formula. So Osiris was this idea of the dying and rising God. So Christianity being the most famous or popular tradition within that Aeon. Prior to that being the Aeon of Isis, which was more like matriarchal Earth religions. You know, whether or not this is true in history is, is one argument, but that was how Crowley saw it. So the Aeon of Horus had started in 1904. Usually, he said that it would last for about 2,000 years. Um, however, Crowley actually kind of intimated that that might not be the case himself. So, you know, before mentioning Akkad, I would say that Akkad didn't invent this idea. It actually comes from Crowley. Um, so Crowley, in the Book of the Law, um, you know, which Crowley received, it actually says in, in one place, um, speaking, you know, to the prophet, your holy place shall be untouched throughout the centuries, though with fire and sword it be burnt down and shattered, yet an invisible house there standeth, and shall stand until the fall of the great equinox, when Frumachus shall arise and the double-wanded one assume my throne and place. So this this was already a prophecy, Frumachus, and there's a few other names for Mott or Mott in, in Crowley's writing, um, is already saying, you know, Mott is the next one. So after my place is Horace talking, Mott will take over and that'll be the next Aeon. So that's already in the Book of the Law. So a, a few other ones is in Crowley's comment on this verse, he said, following Horus will arise the equinox of Ma, the goddess of justice. It may be a hundred or 10,000 years from now for the computation of time is not here as there. So Crowley actually, you know, <laughs> in Akkad's defense, Crowley opened up this whole thing mm -hmm. because he actually said, the equinox of Ma and, and the Aeon of Mott could come, you know, it could be 10,000 years, it could be 100 years, he doesn't know, because time doesn't work the same when you're talking about Aeons. Right. So he kind of let it happen <laughs> at some levels. Um, he also said in one other place in the new comment on the Book of the Law, and this one's really important for what Akkad later does, uh, he said, there is no violent antithesis as that between Osiris and Horus. Strength will prepare the reign of justice. We should begin already, as I deem, to regard this justice as the ideal, whose way we should make ready by virtue of our force and fire. So Mott is the goddess of truth and justice. Um, Akkad, when he did declare the Aeon of Mott, called it the Aeon of truth and justice. So Crowley's already saying, you know, there's this intimate relationship between the Aeon of Horus and the Aeon of Mott, where the force and fire of Horus, which is this kind of force of disintegration, destroys all the pr old traditions and the kind of calcified ways that humanity has lived. And then the Aeon of Maat is this next Aeon that is going to reconstruct and kind of reintegrate everything. So Crowley kind of actually laid the groundwork for this, um, but it was a cod who, in a series of letters um, after Crowley's death from 1948 to 1950, um, with Gerald York, who was an archivist, of kind of trying to deal with Crowley's legacy, uh, a cod actually declared the start of the Aeon of Truth and Justice on April 2nd, 1948. And to me, the, other people have said Akkad was trying to like one-up Crowley, but, and then maybe that's true, you know, I mean, you never know, but on some level, all of this feels to me like a culmination of his own development and work for many decades, um, and not really just like a sudden move. Um, it actually is something he had been talking about for a lot of decades. So 1932, he mentions the Aeon of Maat, you know, in the actually in the appendix to his first book qbl he even mentions it as well so it's been coming it's something that he's been thinking about for a long time and kind of is like the final fulfillment of his work which he was almost only able to do once crowley had passed away so that's some of it but yeah he declared the Aeon of maat to begin in 1948. yeah um but they have an intimate relationship that perhaps the other aeons do mm -hmm. so it's not just that 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 Horus is 40 years and the others were two, three, four, right. five thousand no. years. <laughs> right. You know, the yeah. difference, the difference there is that, and this was already in that quote from Crowley, is that and Akkad kind of reiterated this, is that the, the idea there is that they they're a double Aeon in some sense. So this gets really developed later by people like Kenneth Grant and Nima in the Horus Mott Lodge, uh, which really take up this this idea in this tradition. But yeah, the, the idea there is that 
they're kind of like in dialectical relationship in some way. Um, and and the other thing there is is that it concludes the cycle of the tetragrammaton. So you have yad hey vav hey, and so it's father, mother, son. Without without mat, you don't have the final hey or daughter. Um, so the idea there with both in Akkad and also in other Thelemites like Jack Parsons that there needs to be this feminine daughter figure to like fulfill this. Um, so it, it, it kind of built into some of the, the esotericism here. Yeah. Um, can you just go through some of what you find, like personally, yeah. you, Nick Lachevy, yeah. like exciting <laughs> and, and useful in mm -hmm. Akkad's thought? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, there's, there's a couple of levels to it. Like one, the main reason I got into him, not just because it was like an interesting, obscure thing, <laughs> but because for me, my own background is in Roman Catholic, you know, theology and, and religion and, and Thelema at the same time, um, which I, it's, it's one thing to be an esoteric Christian and, or a Gnostic, I think, but then the Roman Catholic thing and Thelema don't feel like they go together very well. Um, when I discovered Akkad a few years ago, I was like, somebody, had converted to Catholicism, but he was Crowley's magical son, and he was still interested in the Book of the Law. He never stopped talking about it. So how did he do that? So I just wanted to know how he did that. I didn't realize that because he didn't, you know, publish this very clearly, this was going to be this ongoing <laughs> like quest to figure out what had happened, which it still is for me. So that's yeah. part of it, just for me personally. I mean, on another level, I think honestly, many many things in Akkad's work really kind of uh, like prefigure later developments and people don't always know that. So I would say, like we said earlier, this idea that the tree of life is malleable, which makes its way into Kenneth Grant with the night side of the tree, all those kinds of ideas. Akkad really started that in a lot of ways. Um, he wrote a book called The Anatomy of the Body of God, where he talked about the tree of life being kind of infinitely expandable. It could be made into a snowflake. It's like, uh, like it's it just this really kind of beautiful way of thinking about it. Um, so he started that. I mean, other things like this idea of Thelema beyond Aleister Crowley, I feel like Akkad, within Crowley's lifetime, which was really dicey, was the first one to really start developing these ideas and saying, like, you know, this this goes beyond this one person. This this has meaning for me personally. So I feel like he really fulfilled that. And then I would just say that this idea of Ma'at and this idea of, of you know, Ma'at and, and Ma'at's relationship with manifestation, which is this key word for Akkad, is is to me i've been getting more and more into this kind of non-dual death of god theology and and to, i see it in this in this way of of akkad's talking about thelema which was this notion of of l l and la or the plenum and the void or you know th those those two things kind of their interplay creates this circle of manifestation um and you see that in a kind of really interesting way in akkad it's not clearly spelled out you have to like read them then <laughs> try to figure out what's going on there but to me, some of those ideas kind of emerge from him. So they're all really kind of important and interesting. Very cool. And and this is sort of a, a similar question, but so we kind of talked about, you know, what he means for you in your life, but kind of generally, like, yeah. I, I, what does this stuff matter? Why does he matter in 2021, right? Like, you know, yeah. obviously millions of people, I can't grab somebody on the street and they're going to be fascinated by this. But or I guess really the question is, does it matter in 2021? Should it matter yeah. in 2021? Yeah, a, a few years ago when I was working on editing some of his papers, which were I'm still working on, um, my boss at the time was like, I told her I was working on this. She's like, well, that sounds good, but who cares? <laughs> or something like that. And I was like, oh, man. So it was, it was pretty brutal, honestly. But but I would say, so yeah, yeah, it, it's a pretty obscure. You know, there's a lot, a lot of reading involved in this. But I would say that Akkad actually, you know, I, I mentioned it, but this idea of post-Crowley Thelema or even post-Thelema, that's kind of come up more and more now that actually I think in the post thelemic manifesto, which is, came out, you know, last year or something like that, they even mentioned the anima in there. So this Ma'atian tradition that Akkad really starts, I think is actually like a really important development in Thelema. Um, now the, probably the most significant traditions that are really working with that is the Horus Ma'at Lodge falling from Nima. And then, you know, uh, the Typhonian order, um, Starfire Publishing, that Michael Staley's publishing company that's really putting out a lot of this material, including the letters where Akkad declares the Anne of Mott. Um, so I think there's really important stuff that's happening right now where people are being drawn to it. And if I had to guess, I would really say that I think it's because Mott is this figure of, of reintegration, and that's where the whole integral, the integrality piece of the Universal Brotherhood comes in. But Horus is this force and fire and this disintegrative, disintegrative energy, like you know, we're going to destroy 
all the structures of society and the traditions and all of that. And that's really appealing to a lot of people and necessary. But then Mott represents this kind of counterbalance coming to us from the future where, you know, we're building something up in a more kind of a, a universal, more harmonious society. Um, so there's elements of social justice in there. I've actually, somebody declared Akkad to be a, the first uh, social justice snowflake in Philema or something like that, which I don't think is true or fair, but it is true that his ideas in Mott really were, you know, engaged with like things that the world needed and not just kind of personal individual spirituality, but actually this idea that, you know, Mott represents reintegration. Um, so that to me is already appealing. I think people sense that and that's why it's starting to come up a lot more um, in, in a lot of these more recent manifestations of Thelema. Perfect. Well, I can't think of a, of a better place to end yeah. than right there. Yeah. Um, uh, Nick, uh, uh, give us your plugs. Okay, I got some plugs. <laughs> um, so the main one is, you know, if you want to read a little more about this, um, I didn't talk too much about the Horace Mott Lodge, but the Horace Mott Lodge puts out an annual journal called Silver Star, um, and that's available. The new issue is the summer 2021 issue, probably the issue for this year, um, is, is available at Amazon, either Kindle or, or hard copy. And I have a piece in that actually written in 2020 that relates Fratur Akkad and some of his spiritual journey to uh, the atomic bomb test in Twin Peaks, which is another thing I didn't really even get into that Akkad actually is the first person to talk about that, um, the whole atomic bomb thing and occultism. So um, that's in there. Uh, so you can check that you out. You know, Nick, but, yeah. we'll put a pin on that because I, I, I'm a David Lynch obsessive. <laughs> Yeah, where I, I've been almost scared for the long periods that I've been doing this show to mm -hmm. to talk about his work. Oh, really? Because oh, yeah. I gotta do it. Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, I gotta do it. I gotta do it. So yeah. let's, you know, we'll the, the, we want to do more panel shows. I was telling you about that earlier. Yeah. So 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 put a pin pin in that. But yeah. I'm sure already any David Lynch fans are thinking about a certain episode of Twin Peaks to return, oh, yeah. and it fits in it fits in quite well. Yeah, if you're into <laughs> that, so this the article on there talks more about that in the cod. And then um, you know, my blog, uh, thelightinvisible.org, is just where you can find some of past writings about a cod and the Universal Brotherhood. Um, and then one other thing, this is really not super Akkad related, but I've just started a sub stack called Route 333, which for people, you know, kind of numer numerology and Philema is the number of Karans. And so that's this kind of newsletter that's going to be about kind of Americana and occult tradition. So it's a little different than this, but it's, it's still something I'm working on. And then um, again, I, I fig figured I would mention this just because we were talking about like Christianity and Philema and all that. But I also in my other life, <laughs> have uh, a, uh, a piece in this new book, We Cried Justice, Reading the Bible at the Poor People's Campaign. Um, really short piece in there, but the, it basically goes through, if you're interested in like the Bible and social justice and all of that, it kind of is a reading of biblical texts through the lens of like, reading the Bible with the poor. Uh, so that's a new book that comes out October, 2021. Amazing. Yeah. Um, Nick, always a pleasure. I have a yeah. feeling you'll be back soon. I and I have a feeling that there'll be some great announcements and some amazing things related to Frat or Akkad that people can find oh, yeah. out oh, about many, many on this channel. We'll be working on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, always so good to see you. Yeah. Um, okay. Good night, Nick. Good night, yeah. the world. Good night. Goodbye, Thanks everybody.